Thank you. Thank you, Sami. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here in the first uh, school of robotics uh, in the world. Probably uh, I've seen the uh, department of robotics now. Robotics is multidisciplinary, and we really need uh, to bring uh, uh, all the different uh, disciplines together in a place where we can ha have a curriculum uh, that covers all the different aspects of robotics, and I think, uh, Sami, you managed to, to, to do it, to bring uh, uh, a whole school uh, of robotics uh, at UM. So, um, today, I'm going to, to go over uh, a lot of the different things we are working on and uh, the directions where uh, our field is going. And uh, we all know that we are today going beyond uh, what robots used to be, robot in manufacturing, where everything is uh, pre-programmed and uh, decided in advance. W okay, is it me? <laughs> no. So we use fixtures, jigs, and uh, we program the robot, and we spend a lot of time setting up uh, a manufacturing plant. But the promise today is to, is to move to, toward uh, the human environment. And in the human environment, the challenges are huge. So this is really uh, the most exciting times for robotics because it is going to require real connections between perception and action and uh, implementations of all of these in real time. Y you mean the this? No. No, <laughs> no I mean the, the audio. Yeah. <coughs> I, I think he fixed it. Can you hear me? Uh. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sami is doing this in purpose. <laughs> okay, I, I, I can remove one, maybe that would help. Okay, let me try. I have two here. Uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we can try. So, can you still hear me? It, it is okay. Yeah, this is a, a good room for that. So, in this transition, we are seeing a lot of progress, and I, especially in uh, free space motion. In free space motion, we are seeing a lot of uh, development uh, for mobile robotics that uh, takes us in uh, on land, underwater, in many domains. And there, uh, the, the challenges are how to navigate, how to uh, be able to uh, be uh, balanced, and uh, much progress was done. However, really, the challenge is how to go beyond mobility. And this has been a big challenge for many, many years. I recall in the 90s, we will go to ICRA or IROS, and we will see uh, a track, Mobile Robot 1, Mobile Robot 2, Mobile Robot 3, and little was uh, really uh, being done in uh, the challenges of manipulation. So if we were really to, to move forward with robotics, we are going to need to address the, these problems. And uh, probably the last 10 years have seen a lot of uh, development, but we, we have a lot of challenges. Because the real applications of robotics are going to require those two capabilities together, mobility and manipulation. So think about the electrical grids. Do we still need to have people doing that exposed to danger? Can't we find a different way to operate uh, uh, those uh, tasks and bring the human to a safe location? Uh, there is a lot of uh, development in solar energy, but uh, solar energy requires also cleaning those solar panels. And cleaning those solar panels is still done by human. 
and there are many many panels i was uh, just uh, yesterday i was speaking in uh, uh, abu dhabi and uh, th this these images are from there kilometers uh, of solar panels in the desert and uh, people are still cleaning them by hand uh, well we know how how we're going to need to change the infrastructure to deal with uh, electrical car, car stations and uh, i think this is one of the first stations coming in san francisco uh, where robots are uh, providing that service now if we go underwater well underwater we have many many challenges and the planet is 70 probably 73-74% covered by uh, the sea and the oceans and uh, we have really little uh, there in terms of full robotic capabilities. So if we want to, to think about how we uh, service uh, pipelines underwater or if we think about offshore rigs, it, all the major companies in oil and gas are planning to remove human completely from the rigs. And who's going to do the work? I mean, there, there are many, many challenges there in offshore rigs, and uh, they are going to require both mobi mobility and manipulation. Pipelines, it's not only about uh, being able to survey and find uh, problems, it's about fixing the problems and it is done by, by human hands and performing uh, operations in remote areas, uh, very difficult operations that requires uh, manipulation. Another major area is mining. In mining, you, you are not only exposing human to the human safety, but also you are uh, addressing uh, problems, very challenging problems for the environment. Because we are removing a lot of material and th those material need to be processed. And uh, for instance, in uh, gold mines, you are going to have to uh, remove so much material, add a lot of chemicals, and that reduces a lot of uh, uh, danger to the environment. In fact, I found the way to fund our research. Here I am at a gold mine, <laughs> <laughs> and on the left of this image, you can see uh, the vein, we call it the vein, where all the gold is concentrated. Actually, a ton of, uh, of uh, this material produces grams of gold, so you, you need a lot of work. But the problem is, mm -hmm you need to do this in a sort of minimally invasive mining. That is to remove only what is needed and uh, to avoid all the challenges of removing all the materials and then processing them. There is much work now in construction, robotics, uh, that uh, requires removing human from uh, many of those uh, difficult tasks and, and these are some ac actual uh, plans for uh, industrial uh, robotics in, many, uh, in uh, construction. So what is the problem? The problem is that even though we have very good capabilities for mobility, and uh, Ashima is a good example, uh, but still we, we need to think about all the challenges of doing useful things with the, with the arms and hands. In fact, Asimo came to Stanford and spent 10 years. 10 years to, to learn uh, compliant motion and uh, uh, manipulation skills and uh, to be able to do it without all the programming that is required. So if you think about a uh, task like this, what we see is they are going to program the robot at uh, the lowest level of uh, motion of every joint and coordinating all these different joints. And that takes a huge amount of time. So the question is, how come a little child is able to do it? And what are those skills? Uh, 
I mean, humans have amazing skills, and humans rely on not the precision of trajectories, they rely on the, their ability to feel their way. <coughs> Wherever the contact is, we are going to move and feel the way. So the transition from manufacturing to the real world of human and uh, the applications of robotics in those domains are going to require us to abstract the way we program our robots. In offline trajectories, we need precision, so the robots are very heavy and bulky. But now, if we want really to implement human-like skills, then we are going to need compliant robots. Over probably 40 years of robotics, researchers have been challenged by the hardware by the robots spending time fighting with the robots rather than really doing the research. And this is true. So compliant motion is amazing because compliant motion allows us to perform tasks independently of where things are. It's, it's relying on contact and contact information allow us to move to the goal, which is in this case face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. So the robot makes a contact from wherever it starts, and using that strategy, the robot is able to rotate in the proper direction to reach the goal. So I know Sami would like to see some memories, so <laughs> let's do that. So we don't have the sound anymore. That we need little sound. <laughs> the music is nice. So uh, the, the, the young people don't recognize this. This is actually called a VCR. Do you, you know VCR yeah. anymore? <laughs> so we, we're using a VCR. Oh, OK. It's fine. Thanks. With a VCR, we can, we can perform amazing motions without any trajectory. And this was done in uh, the mid-80s, uh, mid-90s, uh, getting robots to perform very complex operations with even halfway compliant motion, because this is a, a Puma robot, implementing uh, all kinds of behavior, uh, including potential field, to avoid collision. So. Most of you know about potential field, you move in to the goal, and if you have an obstacle, you're going to move around the obstacle by repulsive forces. We managed even to do it with mobile obstacles and full arm uh, avoidance. And then we, we built uh, the elastic planning to modify a global plan in real time using bubble bands. And that allow us to interact with uh, plans in real time and modify these plans. And <laughs> <laughs> so later on, we built uh, Romeo and Juliet, and uh, they were performing all kinds of tasks in domestic environment. This is my shirt that I lost. I don't know what it is anymore. Imagine, imagine just uh, planning all these trajectories and programming the robot through trajectories. It would be um, almost impossible. So all of this was taken and implemented on ASHIMO that uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, became compliant and human friendly to interact with human. So when the environment is moving, the robot is going to adapt if the strategy is based on contact information. So the first work on uh, compliant motion that we did with the Puma was relying on uh, increasing the, uh, the backlash, uh, I mean, reducing the backlash of the Puma. And we were able to, to, to reach some level of uh, force control that allow us to perform these tasks and even to get uh, 
the robot to move without knowledge of those wavy surfaces or where uh, the window is located to perform this contact task and the cleaning task. And even if you move the window while the... And th this was back uh, in, in the 80s. The challenge then was how can we improve uh, the, those robots? And uh, in fact, uh, just to show you the amount of friction, this is the friction that you have on one light joint, joint three. So we decided we really need torque control. And to get torque control, you need a sensor. So we retrofied the, the Puma, and here is the Puma with torque feedback, removing all the friction. Now, this was uh, retrofying, and it was very difficult to do that on all the different joints of the Puma. So we decided to build a new robot, a new robot that we called Artisan. And this robot uh, was built in the 90s, in the mid-90s, and it was, uh, yeah. <laughs> So, so uh, we built uh, many different prototypes, and uh, one of the final prototypes uh, was uh, uh, this one, where my students were playing aerodynamic ping pong, and uh, uh, it was really a fun game. <laughs> but you can see the level of performance that you can achieve with your control: zero torque and the robot is just moving. So this work was pursued in collaboration with three people. You can see them here. Sami, <laughs> Gerd, <laughs> and Dieter Fischer. Dieter, actually, who was working with me, uh, moved to, to, uh, to work uh, also to collaborate with the DLR. And the result was uh, uh, fantastic that is uh, we we really achieve torque control that is the those ideas that we developed with artisan uh, uh, ended up to become a reality in a full robot the dlr uh, lightweight robot and that led in fact to the coca robot the first commercial uh, torque controlled <laughs> robot and uh, obviously uh, all of you know what happened next and what is happening today in uh, all around the world. We are changing robotics by building fully capable, safe, torque controlled robot finally to achieve interaction, real interaction, manipulation, cooperation, improving performance and uh, achieving safety. So it's great time. We have new robots. But we still have our old habits. That is the problem. So, are we using this robot to their full capabilities? No, we still use the robot as we use the robots that were without torque sensing and torque feedback. Robot programming, if we want to compare it to what uh, we used to do with computer programming, basically we are still programming robot at, at assembly le level language, <laughs> assembly language level, and uh, there is really uh, no way we can create those programs in real time unless we do abstractions, like we did actually with, with computer programming. So we, we need to create that abstractions, and uh, probably human skills are the best operations, operators that we can use in those programming. So manipulation skills are there with human, but the question is, can we capture them? The question is very important, and today there are a lot of effort in that direction. Learning by demonstration. We try to uh, capture those motions, and then eventually we can, from a given initial condition, create uh, controls to perform those motions. But we are not capturing the skills. 
Unfortunately, what we are doing is uh, we are dealing with specific problem with a specific robot uh, to create a, a, a response of the system uh, to reach a goal. The challenge is how we can understand what is behind the motion. It's not the motion itself. The motion is the integration of all these equations and conditions, but we would like to understand what is the policy behind those motions. So at Stanford, we worked on capturing human strategies by observing the motion and the forces and the interactions, not in terms of the robot motion, but in terms of what relationships we have between object and uh, the environment or other objects. And what it turned out turned out it's something very simple that we all we, we knew all along. And this is that there is a compliant frame in every action. And if we can capture that compliant frame and capture the conditions of the geometry and the physical properties of the environment, then we can we can do much better in terms of generalization. So the learning strategies that uh, we are building, start with the data, but we are not taking trajectories and trying to store trajectories and interpolate between them. What we are trying to do is, is working with those data to understand what is going on, segmenting the data, finding those strategies, and then encoding those strategies for a different system. Robots are very different from human. And with this, we are able to now have strategies that can perform operations like this one. This is uh, the wing of 787. And we're placing the piece. We disturb the location. We start from a different configuration. And the robot is going to find its way on its own. And disturb it again, and the robot will find its way on its own. It has a strategy. We, we, we are not programming any trajectory there. While applying this to different tasks, here is another example, uh, placing the bottle cap. But we need to generalize across different geometries, configuration, orientation. And all of that can be done by understanding the strategy and becoming independent of the specific motion. So we can go on and on and look at different tasks demonstrated, extracting the strategies, encoding them for the robot. This is going to be very important. If we are able to program robot at higher level of abstraction, then we really can talk about automation 4.0, where human and machines are working together interactively. One of the things we always forget is that in manufacturing, we, when we have fixtures, we move to a location with one hand. Now that we have no uh, structure in the real world, one hand is not going to be enough. We need two hands. And with two hands, you can have one playing the role of fixture or uh, bracing a structure, and then you can uh, perform that operation. You have also the dynamic skills. If you are throwing a ball, you need to catch it. And to catch it, that requires understanding prediction and all kind of other uh, skills that needs to be integrated. These could be big balls also. So at the same time, you need to understand how we capture all these characteristics from human. Well, we need to model human. We need to have models of the human if we are going to really interact with human. It turned out there is a cycle. We, we've been working inspired by human behavior skills. And now, with our algorithms and study that we developed in robotics, we are able to apply this to human. So here are some examples of how these algorithms applied to musculoskeletal systems work. They work much more efficiently than mo most of biomechanical models uh, because we, we, we really worked hard, hard at optimizing our 
models. In fact, we, uh, we started even to work on modeling the upper body of human. There is a lot of development in uh, the lower body of the musculoskeletal system. And now we have much more accurate models uh, through MRI that can give us specific models of human. I mean, we rely very often on cadaver to get these models, but these models are not accurate at all. And if we want to understand exactly what is going on, then we need more precise models. In robotics also, we, de we developed metrics that allow us to do much more in terms of understanding the characteristics of the motion. So anyone here plays tennis? No one? No time. You, uh, Sami is. Okay, what about ping pong? Uh, all right. Oh, more. <laughs> all right. Do you need any help uh, improving your ping pong uh, playing? Yeah? Well, I mean, we can help because now we know the secret. We, we, <laughs> we, we, we know the secret. Uh, it, is, it is really about personalization. That is. We need to take the physiology of every person and understand the line of acceleration and the maximum line of acceleration of that person. So the physiology of each individual is very important to create that. By the way, when we are simulating all these uh, uh, complex behaviors, we are doing that in a, a, a homemade uh, environment called Psi 2.0 that allow us to simulate contact, uh, interaction. Multi-contact is a very challenging problem. And when, when you get multi-contact of articulated body, it is still a very difficult problem to solve. And we are able to solve it in real time. And we are able to do this in this environment that we developed at Stanford. So when we apply this, we can think about three major application areas, health and wellness, service and industry, and many of the applications uh, we saw in field robotics. But common to all these different applications is the core research that is the same. That is, we need to connect the perception to action, and we need to do it with our sensors, our mechanisms. We need to do it with the uh, robots that have enough storage of energy. We need to deal with the control, the planning, the reasoning about uh, the environment. We need to estimate, perceive, model the environment. We need to create interaction with human. We need uh, to interface the human to the machine. Well. We need to capture human skills, and we need to make sure that what we're doing is good for society. And uh, all of these things brings all the fields together. So your school is bringing all these different areas. And I really hope the curriculum will span them. And this is the only way we can really do robotics. Everyone in their field can contribute to it, but we really have to have enough understanding of all these different aspects uh, of the system so that we can really build uh, real capable robotic systems. So traditionally, the idea of robotics was, I have a task, then let's plan. So we plan the motion, and let's go and execute that motion. Well, the reality is the planning takes a lot of time for complex tasks and complex robots. And we always ended up with offline planning and then real-time execution of elementary tasks. That cannot be any more expanded to the real world without the full structure of manufacturing. So it's not about building one loop. A mechanical system requires feedback at kilohertz. But the input is going to be much slower. So there is a multi-layer connection between perception and action. The lowest level 
which involves many other levels, is going to deal with the uh, coordination and control of the whole body. The input is a skill coming from perceiving features and understanding these features to select the param parameters of a given skill. Then we can go up and think about the transitions between different actions. So there is this part that I'm not sure if I can point to it with the cursor here. Yes, this part here that uh, I'm calling the functional autonomy of the robot. But there is still much in the cognitive autonomy. And the cognitive autonomy is not going to be uh, sufficient uh, unless we, f for a structured environment, without a connection with human. Let's be realistic. You cannot take a robot open the door of the mine, put the robot for three weeks, and wait for the gold to come out. You really, need, you really need the cognitive ability of a human. And that means we need this interface where a human can communicate by voice, by haptics, by direct contact, or programming. So this is a collaborative multi-layer architecture that is critical to performing uh, those operations. It, it involves perception, all kind of uh, primitives for perception, and all kind of primitives for action. Here is an example of uh, primitives for perception. You cannot see the glass properly to grasp it, so you touch, feel, determine the normals, and then you can have a grasp. And once you have the grasp, you're able to uh, stabilize uh, a force closure uh, with, the, with the glass without breaking it, but sufficiently to make it uh, held by the hand. So when we go to complex humanoid robots, It is really a challenging problem if you think about everything that is need to be done in real time. So we're reaching to a goal, and we have the posture of the robot. We have that posture that is going to be uh, working together with the task. And at the same time, you have all the contact to control. You have many types of constraints from uh, physical constraints on the robot, self-collision, uh, joint limits, to obstacles, and also you need still to balance. Yes, we can, we have frameworks, we have configuration space frameworks to uh, capture all of this for a given task and do the planning, and now try to execute those motions by locking all the joints on those trajectories. But first of all, the planning itself will be very difficult, long, not real time. And beside, we're going to discover at every instant we need to change the plan. So this is really a big challenge. And the question is, how can we, how can we do it? And uh, if we look at our environment, we find humans that are doing that every day, every time, successfully. So what is the secret? <laughs> yeah, come on, you know. Uh, uh, take this glass. <laughs> so did you see what he's doing? So take the glass. <laughs> so first of all, he's focusing on the task. Doesn't, doesn't care about all the joint motion of the whole body, just moving the hand as if the hand was like pulled toward the top. But at the same time, in the background, you have another controller he, your Sami is not thinking about, which is how to control the posture. And then automatically, you have all these other behavior that are dealing with, with the constraints. So, but all of these are working together. Can we be inspired to create something like that for a robot? Well, yes. Independent controllers that can work together. So I'm not going to go in the mathematics and details of this, but essentially we are able to create connections between 
all these different behaviors, controllers dealing with different aspects of the problem. So we have the constraints, we have the different goals, and we have priorities about those goals. That is, the final posture is not critical, but the task is a higher, uh, has higher priority, but also the constraints have to not be violated. And that resulted in what we call the constraints consistent whole body control algorithm. This is a sort of um, a gradient descent in a space where you have barriers of potential, but uh, also guided control that allows you to not reach those barriers and avoid for any of the tasks to move in those directions where you have constraints. So now imagine yourself, you know, these games, uh, you go over the pool and you have to be balancing over uh, balls and different things. So you have a, a humanoid balancing over multiple surfaces, f slippery surfaces, maintaining contact, without slipping, so it means all the reaction forces has to be uh, inside the corner frictions. And it works, and this is real time. So, ASHIMO doesn't have torque control. We couldn't implement this on ASHIMO. We waited until uh, we were able to come again to Munich to DLR and implement this on Toro. <laughs> so this is uh, Mikhail, my student, implementing this and uh, showing the performance that are remarkable in terms of uh, f validation of uh, that algorithm that we, we, we saw in simulation. Now that you can control multiple contact, just add a gate and we can climb and you can uh, move up uh, in a way that is balanced without slipping and at the same time dealing with the gravity. So another thing about human that is amazing and we very often forget, we don't need to change tools all the time as we do in manufacturing. We use, we use actually uh, different tools more flexible tools. So that brought the idea of a supraped. Balancing on two f legs is very difficult. But especially if we go outdoor and if the environment is not flat. So with the supraped is going from two biped, triped, quadruped, supraped. Now you can look forward, identify locations, examine the friction, and then uh, apply the proper forces to move. So this is going to require us, as you can see, to control contact forces and to be able to perceive the environment, the physical properties, so that you, you, you apply the proper forces and all the multi-contact forces at the same time so that the robot remains stable. So the, the ways of in interaction between robots and human can be done at m multiple levels. One is by direct contact. So if you go to a show of ASHIMO, they tell you there is one rule with ASHIMO. Don't touch it. We're breaking the rule. And we're breaking the rule. We broke the rule. This was uh, probably t 2004 when uh, we implemented this controller with wrist force sensors and we were able to get ASIMO uh, a sense of contact. In fact, if you look closely, you can see how surprised ASIMO is. What is happening? What's going on here? <laughs> These are some of the things uh, Sami worked on how to interact safely with human. And uh, I this is uh, some work my students are doing in performing multi-contact uh, and uh, in the posture space as you move 
the robot and create those motions. Now, interactions between human and machines can be done at a distance through haptics. And this modality is really amazing and very important in many applications where human cannot be or should not be. So, in this architecture, the connection with human is very important. That is, we have another loop taking specification from the human, translating this into that uh, program that is going to be done using the skills. So it's high-level program with primitives that are autonomous enough to perform the task. So I talked about the high-tension cables. Let me show you an example of this. So here we are using the haptic interaction. So you can imagine this is at a distance. And now you are able to perform this task remotely. Well, th this is exactly what we did with, with Ashimo. Uh, with Ashimo. With uh, Ashimo. Actually, we did it also with Ashimo. We did it with Ocean One. Now, Ocean One can go deep, deeper than where human can go. And because of that, uh, you, you're going to perform very complex tasks. And those tasks are going to require cognitive abilities that the robot is not going to have. So when the robot is going to touch the seabed, you're sitting on the boat with your haptic device and interface, and you're going to feel exactly what the robot is doing. This is your avatar in the water. So we built this robot to have the capability of reaching 200 meters. Great. But this is not enough. So not enough because really, I mean, so many uh, tasks are at 100 and 100 of meters. So we were investigating how can we build, rebuild this robot to, uh, to have capabilities of diving to maybe 1,000 meters. And most of the challenge, most, because there are a lot of challenges, but most of the challenge is how to make the robot buoyant at 1,000 meters. Because this robot is floating in the water because of uh, those uh, foams, uh, the, the f flotation that is designed uh, to allow the robot to lose its weight in the water. But under pressure, this is going to collapse. So what do you do? Well, you make them stronger by adding material higher density. Higher density means more weight. More weight means more volume. And your robot will grow and grow and grow and grow and becomes monstrous. You cannot really interact physically with the environment. Fortunately, there we discovered there are material based on uh, microspheres that makes the material very light but very strong. And we were able to redesign the robot for 1,000 meters. As I'm speaking right now, my students are not sleeping. They are working on assembling this robot. And the reason is, by the end of the month, we need to chi ship the robot at uh, the end of the week. Uh, we need to ship this robot to the Mediterranean for uh, four other missions that will take us uh, from the coast of France uh, to the coast of uh, uh, Corsica for dives that will go between uh, 40 meters to 500 meters. Oh my god. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> That will start in March 15th. You're invited, Sami. <laughs> so the last mission was was uh, in the also in the Mediterranean, and it was it was on 
a shipwreck of King Louis XIV uh, called Lune. Lune is a military boat that was returning from North Africa and uh, somehow sunk off the coast of France. Actually, it was found in 1993 uh, about 20 kilometers from the coast. Was found by robots. Vehicles. Vehicles can find, can see, can discover, but they cannot do. And in order to reach this boat, so we need some sound, please, if possible. Sound. <laughs> so in order to reach, they use uh, a suit and divers will have, yeah, you can see now, uh, much better with sound. <laughs> I mean, can, can you imagine you're confined to this space and now you're diving with it? Anyway, this works for uh, 100, 150 meters and you still cannot touch properly the objects. So it's really, really difficult. But you have people who are crazy, they can dive deeper than 40, 50 meters, which is comfortable for human divers. So in the North Sea, they, they dive to 160 meters. But in order to do that, they have to stay for almost three weeks confined inside a cylinder, uh, compressed, and then they, they breathe a, a, a mixture of oxygen and helium because oxygen becomes toxic at high pressure. So they are sitting here and for one week, then they, they go and do the work. This is the work at 160. Y you can hear the helium. <laughs> And after that, one more week, and then they can go come out. Now he's saying, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, I can speak normally. So, Ocean One, Ocean One, <laughs> Ocean One was designed to, to really, uh, r I mean, substitute for, for these poor people and others uh, so that we, we can actually reach the depth without exposing humans to danger. And the key was to build a robot with uh, all the capabilities of manipulation integrated. It, it is not taking a vehicle and placing arms. The the whole system is designed to do this integration uh, so that we can achieve uh, those tasks uh, almost like a diver. So we started with uh, the simulation uh, that is done again in, in the SI system and now we are interacting with the simulation through the haptic uh, devices with the two arms and this allows us to have access to the robot system from multiple stations. So if you need help uh, from uh, a colleague in a different conti continent, you can, you can get that help from a different station. Now there is a big problem underwater. Underwater is similar to space in terms of the fact that you're floating, but now you're floating in a material that has resistance. When you move your arm, the inertia is changing by the mass of the water that you are pushing. And also the communication is very hard because you don't have uh, electromagnetic signals. So the idea is to use uh, communication with optical modems. Optical is limited in distance, 10, 15, 30 meters maximum. So the idea is you have a, a fleet of robots working and you have a station that is going to provide that communication that is connected to the boat. But more importantly is the energy, the, the power that you need. Batteries are very difficult uh, to design for 
uh, operations longer than one hour. So those missions typically last for seven hours and more. So this is why you really need a relay station to connect these robots to recharge and communicate and be uh, free without wires. Another thing about these robots is the fact that here you can see the dynamics at the arms. When you project the dynamics at the arms, you can see how the dynamics is changing. And when you bring these arms to interact with objects, you are going to again change the dynamics in a very substantial way. That is, you need to have these models in order to do proper manipulation and uh, handling of the contact, reducing the amount of uh, impact forces. And above all, there is something very, very important about the structure. This is a macro mini structure. Like in space, you have a vehicle, you have an arm, you are going to do a ducking, you're going to destroy everything unless you're moving maybe very slow, maybe very, very slow. Well, here, when you want to stop, the arms are going to bend. And they are bending because they can respond very quickly. This is the light weight part of the structure. And by combining the coordination between the vehicle and the arm, you can achieve very fast responses to docking and dynamic interaction. You have also to think about the fact that if your arm is extended, you are going to see the whole dynamics of the vehicle. So you have to come in postures that reduces the inertia so the impact forces at the interactions are moderate so you can have safe contact. All right, well, all of this is good, but we need to build the robot. And building the robot is a very, very challenging problem. We were collaborating with uh, Mecca Robotics, and uh, Mecca provided a lot of support with the arm design. And uh, we designed uh, the rest of the robot, which involved many components, a lot of electronics, and the head. And you can see uh, all these uh, uh, phases at the end, assembling, putting uh, everything together uh, in the lab, which is really hard. But we have amazing students that uh, were able to, to do it. Like today, they are still working on the new, uh, the new ocean one. So this robot, you cannot test it in, in, in the lab. It doesn't operate in the air because uh, the arms are too heavy. Uh, they are oil filled so that you can have the same pressure uh, inside and outside of the arms. So we have to take this heavy robot to the pool, put it in the pool, and then be able to uh, uh, test it. So we have fortunately a pool, but it is uphill. So we have to pull the robot all the way <laughs> to the pool. Then there is a, a special ramp. We bring the robot down the ramp to the water. And once in the water, we discover a problem. We go back to the lab <laughs> and, and back and forth, testing, adding, going back and forth, little by little, uh, haptic interaction. The robot started to move. Uh, trying to imitate a dolphin motion, almost, almost, and li little more experiments and little more trips to, to the pool. Finally, uh, the robot was uh, moving very well, and you can see uh, uh, a lot of, this is uh, 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 the student pool, so the students were sitting watching the robot, sometimes swimming with the robot. Anyway, the robot was, became ready for the mission, and uh, we took it across Stanford, we put it in a box, and we ship it to the Mediterranean. Uh, the André Malraux is a vessel of King... Uh, of King uh, <laughs> La Lune is the, the vessel of King Louis XIV. The André Malraux is the scientific uh, boat of uh, uh, the archaeology division of uh, the Ministry of Culture in France that uh, uh, was participating with us in that mission. And here's the robot landing on the... <laughs> and now, imagine the fear. I mean, 
we were there, we tested our robot in one meter. <laughs> and now we're going to, to dump it in the water and try to, to, to see what, what's going to happen. And okay, we were reasonable. We said, okay, let's make sure that a diver can go and rescue the robot when it's going to explode. So be, because we didn't know if, if these uh, uh, connectors are going to resist the, the pressure. So we went to 15 meters. We placed the robot there. Olivia was with the robot testing and checking everything. And amazingly, the robot was really performing extremely well. So uh, Olivia said, everything is fine. Let's go. The day after we went uh, to La Lune uh, location, it took a lot of time to reach it. And finally, here we are uh, very close to La Lune, about a few meters above. And you can see this huge cannon, uh, uh, the, the two cannons uh, that remain standing uh, on La Lune. And our archaeologist uh, colleagues wanted us to reach this vase between the two cannons. Sure, no problems. We maneuver, and the robot is coming closer and closer. And suddenly, we realize we forget one thing. It was our first time going to the bottom of the, of the sea. And you have these thrusters rolling, and all the sediment came up. And we lost visibility. And uh, you will see it a little later in, in, in the video, all the, 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 the the sediment that, that are around the robot, but the robot get caught between the two cannon. Not in, this is not the, the picture that I wanted to show, but in any case, the robot was like caught. It was midnight. The captain was really worried because the sea was getting rough. And uh, at one moment he said, five minutes, we're leaving. Oh my God. <laughs> we're not leaving the robot. No one can rescue it. He, he will cut the cable and we leave. And, and you can see the face of Hannah. <laughs> she was praying, my God, please. <laughs> so here is the thing. This robot was caught between the cannon, but, but actually this is not a vehicle because we started operating the, the thrusters backward and it was more sediment and, and completely we lost visibility. We couldn't see anything. But this robot has arms. And arms are very useful to push yourself. So this was what I was trying to do. I suddenly realized, OK, we're, we're losing it. Let's break everything down there. And started pushing with the haptic device on the arms against this cannon. And suddenly the robot jumped. And I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was like incredible moment because we really thought we we lost the robot, but but uh, immediately we brought the robot to the surface, and uh, the day after the sea was really really rough, we we uh, we couldn't go. We said, well, the day after, the following day, uh, the boat had a problem, the power system was down. Anyway. The last day of the mission for the boat, the boat was supposed to go to the Atlantic. Uh, the last day, we uh, left the port at 5 in the morning. And by noon, we came back with this vase that uh, immediately we place in a container. This is how you proceed underwater. You take uh, your artifact, you put, it in, put them in the container, you close the container, and then the container comes on its own to the surface. And uh, here is the container, and here is the treasure. And here is my uh, colleague from uh, DRASM who was so happy. Uh, my students who wanted to touch this uh, object. And, and the archaeologist who was like, my god, you didn't break anything. It's, it's like no scratches. And she said, oh, this is a Catalan vase. It has four ears. And this is, you can see the history of the water, centuries of uh, uh, staying in the water without any contact with human. And now it's part of uh, the treasures in France. Everyone asks me, 
Did you get to have it? <laughs> no. <laughs> the year after, we went to Santorini. Santorini is beautiful. D don't miss it if you haven't been there. <laughs> but, but we went to a volcano called the Colombo volcano. And uh, uh, actually, uh, it was in a mission with uh, ZDF, uh, the television, the German television. And we, we, t we took the robot there. And uh, if the video works, I don't know why it's not working. Oh, yeah. So, so we took the robot. The boat wasn't as good as the other <laughs> uh, robot. And, and in here, w w they, they were very interested in communication and support. So they wanted us to interact with the divers and uh, uh, create uh, 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 different behaviors that will allow uh, the divers to perform different tasks while the robot is responding. Uh, so putting light on objects and uh, measuring, etc. Here is a sample from that volcano. They gave it to me, but I didn't take it. I heard it, it will smell very bad after a while. So here is the video that I hope it's... Oh. <laughs> I know this problem. Uh, so we have uh, an... Uh, a small okay the problem is uh okay so now it's going to work but i have to stop <coughs> sound please so this is uh la lune and uh, this robot is, is is very heavy so we need a crane to put it in the water you need divers in the water to detach the, the robot. But once uh, the robot is free, then it's happily swimming. This is at 15 meters. And um, this is uh, just uh, uh, very close to Marseille, where we're going again. Uh, but uh, in a different location. So Olivia was testing uh, the different tasks and uh, everything. We, ha we had a, a small, tiny problem with the hands, but you can see these hands, uh, these hands were designed to wrap around uh, objects uh, and they have only one actuator, so it's uh, under-actuated hands. Anyway, Olivia was satisfied and saying, you're ready, you can do it. I'm not coming. <laughs> so this is uh, the control room where you have uh, all the crews, the archaeologists, uh, the and you, you have another robot which is holding uh, the power for us. Y you can see the robot coming from, from the top between the two cannons. And you see uh, the sediment, little by little, coming. Stop, stop, no, too late. <laughs> and here is the robot between the two cannon. Even the fish were surprised, what is this? <laughs> and uh, Hannah continue the prayer. <laughs> and. Uh, Little by little, the robot was freed through the haptic uh, contact. And quickly, we went up and uh, returned to port. So this was on Friday, uh, April the 15th, when we came back, located the vase. And now we're going to grasp it. They are very slippery and very hard to grasp. And you need to secure the grasp with another hand, so you have the two hands holding the, the vase. So now we're going to place it in the container.
He's asking to close the container, which is the end of the mission, basically. Ah. <laughs> Oh my God, it was a whole week of uh, suffering, <laughs> and finally here we have it. And I managed to touch it first. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, it was a big celebration with uh, champagne for everyone, including the robot. <laughs> so, so this was a secret mission. We, we, we had a press conference uh, two weeks later in Marseille at the Museum de la Mer, and uh, everyone wanted to, to see this robot. The media was there, and uh, we ended up uh, leaving the robot for one month in Marseille at the museum uh, before returning to Stanford. But it was also an amazing experience for our students, I mean, to go to the field and uh, to, to suffer <laughs> through the whole process, but finally to succeed. So uh, uh, to meet uh, uh, archaeologists, scientists, it was a really quite amazing uh, uh, experience. And right now we are still working on this one. Uh, hopefully uh, soon we will be able to, to, uh, to have more stories to tell. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to take questions. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The, the sediment we we had to learn. I mean, the first time when uh, we went, we were really uh, happily moving very fast and uh, using the thrusters much more. Uh, the second time we were much more careful. We we just let the robot come closer. I mean, the last meter or or two, you have to be very careful. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, you, you're going still to have uh, sediment coming. And uh, uh, what we usually do uh, every time after each uh, uh, dive, uh, we, ha we spend a lot of time cleaning. Uh, but uh, the robot itself is uh, completely uh, closed. I mean, there is no way to get anything inside. It is on uh, the thrusters themselves uh, that you have to be very careful. Uh, and also, uh, the, the, um, in the sea, uh, you have a lot of salt uh, that uh, affect many components uh, from outside. But uh, uh, there, there is a more uh, interesting f uh, 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 actuation that you can have, uh, uh, and uh, we are working on some other concepts that would remove the thrusters and work with the uh, like more like a fish, how fish can move, and uh, well, that 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 will take a little bit more time uh, to achieve. But it is it is something that you can handle by uh, reducing uh, the the speed of your motion. Yes. Yeah, uh, so wel welding and repair and maintenance uh, of pipelines is actually uh, our goal. And when uh, we have a lot of discussion with uh, uh, some of the major uh, uh, pipe uh, oil and gas companies that are very, very much interested in those capabilities. Now, uh, uh, the, 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 the welding is going to require uh, uh, a close perception of the line of motion and uh, we are doing that right now uh, uh, in the air on on land uh, and we are developing uh, the techniques where haptically we we touch the different surfaces and then the robot autonomously will perform uh, the, that motion. Uh, and uh, uh, the speed of the motion is very important in welding. But uh, uh, we haven't yet applied it uh, uh, to um, 
uh, to applications underwater, and that is going to take uh, obviously time. Realize that we are not talking about uh, operations with one robot, and it, it, it is going to be always heterogeneous uh, set of robots. I mean, uh, when you have uh, uh, operations, you have one robot uh, working like a diver, but other robots are providing support for uh, power, other robots providing uh, overview of the locations and, and uh, the environment. So there are a lot of other robots involved, and there will be also other uh, applications that would require multiple robots. So yes, uh, the more complex task w will, will come, and uh, uh, we, we are building uh, uh, robots that are very, very complex, but we are getting good at it now. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, what's, uh, what about the communication between the robot and the diver robot and the diver? Is it uh, by gestures or by sound? Or yeah. Yeah, so in the Santorini mission, uh, this was uh, uh, the, the topic that we were uh, examining, and this was using a uh, uh, gesture uh, to see if the robot can capture the gestures mm -hmm. and uh, understand uh, the communication. Now, what is really important uh, in, in those interactions is that we have a human uh, on the boat that is also uh, intervening and seeing the gestures. So I can tell you in the 15-meter uh, uh, mission where a diver was testing the robot, actually I was uh, uh, interacting with, with, the ro with the diver by understanding the gestures of the diver myself and communicating that to the, to the robot. Yes, it was a bigger loop. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I mean, a lot of the development today in communication, in gesture communication, and uh, the language of communication uh, are going to be more and more uh, autonomous. Uh, but uh, I really believe still we need uh, the cognitive abilities of a human. So I still believe in those challenging tasks, you, you can build uh, enough autonomy. We have a lot of autonomy in, on the robot. The robot is coordinating everything. We, we just uh, focus on the tool and what we need to do. Collision avoidance, every aspect of the, of the task is done by the robot. But, but then still you need the human, and, uh, and having the human helps with the communication. Yes? Yeah, uh, in, in, in fact, uh, ultrasonic is uh, one modality that is very important. We, we could not rely on that only because the communication to haptics uh, requires uh, really fast communication and uh, ultrasound, as you know, in the water is slow. But we are using ultrasound for other uh, functionalities, and uh, uh, we have uh, also communication with other robots, local robots, uh, uh, through direct lines or through uh, communication. Uh, uh, in fact, th this is, uh, I mean, we have to realize a mission with those robots requires heterogeneous robots. You need multiple robots to be working together. No, you, you can't have one person uh, for every mission. But, uh, uh, I mean, in the beginning, you can see all the people around, and, and uh, we, we have uh, one person handling one and the, the others. But eventually, this could be done by, by one operator over like several uh, uh, robots uh, in interacting. But it would require more, um, uh, I mean, work on how you uh, coordinate all these different robots, which we are doing on land, but we now have to deal with, with the water, with the current. I mean, I remember I, I reached the vase, I was there in front of it, and I said, can I go and take it? And uh, the, 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 the archaeologist told me, no, 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 wait, uh, the camera is not rolling. <laughs> so while I was waiting, the, the, the robot like was, was moving away, and this is something very simple that you can do to, to keep station. And, but, but I mean, there, there are a lot of things that needs to come together. The main thing was to bring a robot down there without 
imploding or exploding, and we realize that part. So in the new in the new robot, we have uh, uh, head moving. So when the arms are moving, you can see your hands. You can uh, also uh, 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 do uh, station keeping, and you can do a lot of other things. Um, uh, we are waiting for some part to to be finished. We did a lot of tests in in the pool, but we will see. Uh, so there 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 are a lot of progress in that uh, that domain. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a very interesting, inspiring talk. I was wondering the algorithm that you are developing. How much percent of them are conventional methods based? How much are like machine learning and deep learning? Okay. Thank you for this question. You give me an opportunity now to talk about machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you, you saw this robot in the water. How many of you believe that we can solve the whole problem by just collecting data and using this data through deep learning, machine learning to operate the robot? How many of you think that would be sufficient? Not many. One. <laughs> okay. So machine learning is an amazing tool, amazing, amazing tool, but it has to be used wisely. And unfortunately, today we are promising so many things. Just everything would be resolved with machine learning, and and the reality is, you you have a physical system, and it's not about positions on the uh, in space for the trajectory where you're moving. It's about a lot of other dynamics. You have the velocity, you have the acceleration, you have even higher order uh, characteristics. And if you think about all of these for a robot with uh, sufficiently number of degrees of freedom to, to do this task, the space is huge. And it is really, really difficult to capture uh, the dynamics and the physical properties by, uh, by just thinking about data uh, that you're observing. So machine learning is amazing and really necessary everywhere where you do not, do not have models. If you have models, please use them. You can, you can analyze, you can see the boundaries of your uh, algorithms, you can address all of that. But we have so much that we don't understand, we cannot model, like human skills. How can we capture human skills? So we use machine learning, but we use it with physical models to find the parameterization of that compliant frame, where to place the uh, uh, center of compliance and which directions and where we are switching and all these characteristics. The result is going to be uh, a strategy, uh, b basically the policy. And once you have the policy, then you can apply it in a very general way. I do not want us to learn the trajectory of the motion and collect all that data in order to do something with the hands. Let's remove the robot. If we understand how we can apply forces to the object, then we don't need the robot. We can study the skill just in six-dimensional problem, and then we have a problem that is very general, but then later we can connect the robot. But for the robot, there are other things we need to understand, like what posture, how to perform avoidance, there are other things that we apply. So in our algorithm, we, I talked about this separation between the different controllers, and one of uh, them, the task controller, relies on skills that obtain from machine learning, but not with the objective of recording how I'm moving, but recording the strategies. So, Yes, machine learning is a powerful tool, but it is not the only tool that we can use to solve the, the problems in robotics. We need to look at the physical problems. You can add one sensor and you modify completely the problem. 
So we need really to understand what is happening at every aspect of the task, every aspect of the constraints, and how we can address them, not just by collecting data and, and, and do m all these forms and repeating different things and trying to, you, you will never uh, be able to generalize to every aspect, every different robot, every characteristics of complex tasks. Thank you for your question. <laughs> yes. Uh, I wasn't clear about the beginning of your question, if you can repeat it. Uh -huh. uh, underwater, no, no, actually uh, our haptic and haptic interaction is done uh, through the four sensors. And the, we designed the four sensors in a way that calibrated completely to find and resolve the contact, to extract the contact state not to extract, uh, I mean, yes, the sensors are subject to a lot of things, dynamics when you move, even in the air. I mean, you, you move, uh, I mean, some naive people would think, oh, the, I, I have this force information, it's the contact information. No, you have a mass moving and it has inertia, you have to observe what exactly the contact information is. That's what we do underwater with hydrodynamics and we look at every aspect of the problem and then we can determine the contact forces and the contact forces are reproduced at the haptic site. Yes? Yeah, well, uh, the, the first uh, I mean, uh, objective was to create a, a stereo vision so the operator can see uh, depth uh, as we moved. So th that's why the robot has uh, two eyes and they are, you have two cameras inside, th then you can see uh, in stereo. <laughs> Unfortunately, during the mission, the, the panels that we use for the stereo didn't arrive to, to the boat and we were using multiple screens, which is really hard. But uh, the vision that we have uh, right now is integrated in inside a, 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 a sphere that uh, that is also uh, ch processing the stereo and the depth information uh, within, I mean, locally, and then transmitting this information. Uh, uh, on the robot to the cylinder. So you, you can see there is a cylinder at the back and that cylinder contains all the computer uh, uh, and uh, processing of sensory information. And that information is t used locally for uh, positioning the robot in the environment and also split up coming back to the interface uh, to provide the human with uh, uh, a sufficient rate of uh, stereo vision. And uh, for now, we don't have too much of problem of communication we are because we are still using a wire. Uh, a optical modem will provide sufficient uh, bandwidth for uh, the control for the haptics. Uh, we need, uh, it is quite challenging to, to get high definition uh, uh, imaging through uh, optical modems and uh, uh, this technology is progressing. A lot of companies are looking into it, and I'm sure that will, will, will come in, in the near future. Yeah? Why did Stanford build the arms? Why did Stanford build this robot? Yeah, the arms of the robot. Oh, why we didn't build the arms? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, uh, the reason we didn't build it, it that was that the amount of time and uh, the amount of uh, effort that uh, was needed was completely uh, beyond, uh, I mean, it would have taken much longer time uh, for us. There was a lot of engineering. So underwater arms today, like you have the shilling arm, you have a very uh, rigid and stiff structure that 
don't care about being broken. Uh, uh, now, if you are building a lightweight arm, compliant arm with force sensing uh, and torque sensing, then you are going to be uh, subject to a lot of pressure and you have to build inside electronics that can uh, be uh, in the oil. So you have oil inside, you have regulators from outside, and you at any moment you have the same pressure inside and outside. And the difficulties are huge. So we, uh, we work with the mecha robotics uh, who were, uh, had no experience in underwater like us. We didn't have any experience <laughs> with underwater. And uh, they, they hire uh, engineers to, to really focus on those problems. And uh, that, uh, that brought us to, to learn a lot about underwater uh, problems. So just one example about underwater. Because you have the electronics exposed to the pressure at 1,000 meters, your electronics is at that pressure. It's not going to work. I mean, space uh, robotics is challenging because all the electronics is going to be subject to radiation. Underwater, you have much more problems. How do you, do, uh, how do you deal with the pressure? Well, because pressure is going to affect your oscillators. And your oscillator, your clock is going to be completely off. So we needed to, when we moved from 200 meters to 1,000 meters, we needed to change all the boards. We redesigned completely the arm. And we, we, we built boards that, that are capable of sustaining uh, high pressure. There, there are so many problems you, you would never imagine uh, that uh, you, you would have once you have liquid outside coming at you. And uh, uh, it, is, it is really, really challenging. I mean, we have enough challenge. That's why we have collaboration. And I always believe in collaboration. Now we're talking about future collaboration uh, with you guys uh, about the future uh, arms that we would like to to have. Right now, the arms are making use of Siri elastic actuation, uh, wh which provides some level of torque control, but I don't uh, think it is the sufficient level that I like. Uh, I like torque sensing. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, improvements that can be made in the next design, so we are considering the design of new arms for the next generation. But right now, we modified a lot of things on this arm that, these arms that we have, and uh, we modified the wrist that was very weak. We, we improved all kind of uh, uh, aspect of the, of the arms, but still, it's not the, the, the best arm. As I said, always in robotics, we fight with the hardware. If we get the right hardware, it's amazing yeah. all the progress we can make. There was a question over there, yes? The hard, uh, hardware, you mean? Yeah. Yes. The main thing that we really need to figure out is how we bring grasping. I mean, think about it. Everything we, 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 we talk about in manipulation is going to end up in the hands. I mean, I tell my students, well, I mean, I'm building all, all of this for your hands to reach the environment and do the manipulation. U ultimately, this is really the goal. If we had flying hands, that would be wonderful. But we, we, still, we still don't have really the, 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 that critical hardware part that we can use in uh, a confidence that we say we have the hand. So we, we, are, we have been working with different uh, groups. We, one, one group uh, is uh, uh, built uh, uh, for finger hand. Uh, this is one of my former PhD student uh, company. And, and it is nice, but it is uh, sort of uh, 
uh, not robust enough uh, to to really uh, use in a, a general way. Uh, it doesn't have torque sensing. Uh, it, it doesn't have tactile sensing uh, or contact sensing. It doesn't integrate all of these. Uh, Shunk has fantastic uh, designs, but still these are designs that needs a lot of work uh, to reach a level of uh, uh, really commercial use or uh, robustness in, in even laboratory use. So I really think hands are a problem. Uh, we made a huge progress with the, with the, with arms, and I, I, I think there there will be a lot of improvement of arms that will be coming. But uh, I, I really want to see these hands coming uh, to laboratories where we we can start working seriously with uh, with uh, interaction and complex task and manipulation. We need dexterous hands. Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, m maybe uh, thinking about soft hands and uh, or distributed uh, skin on the hand. And uh, uh, so we, we, we're right now uh, building a hand with a, a palm. And, uh, and I mean, uh, we, we put fingers, but this motion is so important. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, and this is not uh, like just a finger. This is going to create uh, amazing ways of holding any object you are manipulating. The, the question is uh, how complex this is going to be. Do we need uh, to have uh, 34 degrees of freedom or can we do it with uh, less degrees of freedom? I, I think there is a lot of studies uh, around this area, but I believe the material is a huge, of huge importance and importance and uh, currently we are looking at one actuator actuated hand uh, but we are putting a lot of material a lot of materi material uh, here to increase the the friction i mean one of the problem i saw when we were trying to grasp these vases underwater i grasped 10 of them every time it would slip and the material will change all of that but uh, one degree of freedom is not enough. So we, we, our colleagues in uh, uh, Pisa, they are working on uh, d different modalities. There are uh, a lot of work here as well. And, and I, I really think uh, uh, we really need to focus a little bit more on the integration of new material sensing and uh, actuation of, of hands that is fully integrated with wrist force sensor. Don't forget the wrist force sensor. Uh, with the torque control, you need co-located information in order to control properly your task, and you need torque support sensor, you need a lot of sensing on the hand uh, with the new material and uh, uh, the, the new uh, mechatronic integration. We, we can do it. Mm -hmm. to some point because uh, like humans don't have thrust thrusters and humans are also not uh, known to be the best swimmers in the, in the animal kingdom. So um, why, um, like especially for this underwater robot, this, this human shape, and why not rather uh, an armed seal? But, uh, that, that sounds wrong, like a seal with, with arms. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so where is the robot? Where is the robot? <laughs> uh, you can recognize the robot, it doesn't have legs. Okay, uh, so, uh, so this is an avatar of a diver and it's going to work in environment uh, that are that were built by human. I mean, th this is the same uh, discussion when we talk why uh, we take the human shape 
on, on, on land for robots uh, in the air. And, and the question is, uh, I always answer, the question is the functionalities. We need two arms to carry the two hands. We need uh, two eyes, at least we need some vision to see the hands. So th this brings the upper body already. And uh, so the functionalities are very important in order to do tasks involving manipulation. Uh, you need two arms and you need uh, the head. Then um, the body itself in the water uh, doesn't require the the legs, we, 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 uh, we could uh, have done a different design with uh, a tail and uh, uh, I, I, I think it would have been much more complex to stabilize and so, but we are working on, on some other additional concept. Uh, one other concept is, is uh, the center of buoyancy and, and uh, the, because you move your arms, you change the center of mass. And what you want to do is to have the center of buoyancy and center of mass together. That is the, the location. So there are a lot of uh, challenges, but uh, broadly saying you don't need the shape uh, to do the functionalities. But it turned out this head was the hardest part in the design. It took a lot of time because I insisted to create a, a, a shape that communicate uh, friendliness to communication with human. And this is very important uh, aspect in the communication. My colleague archaeologists who were working with it said, I mean, this robot looked like a little child in the water trying to learn. And I was, I was not uh, trying to uh, teach too fast. So I was communicate and not realizing that I was on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this uh, this uh, uh, I, I think there is the, the this this uh, location of uncanny valley that that is uh, r really critical for all robot uh, aspect of robotics, and in the design of uh, robots we have to pay a lot of attention to it, in order to facilitate the communication between human. Uh, and robot in their uh, collaboration, and and uh, that's why uh, uh, we 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 put this shape. If we modify the shape, it will look l probably different uh, uh, differently, and uh, it probably the interaction will be slightly different. But what is critical is the functionalities, and that is what what we have in here. Okay, since I know no no wait no, no clapping yet. Since I know everybody would like to ask more questions, I think we can do this till tomorrow. I want to see. <laughs> I, I, this is my first visit <laughs> here. <laughs> no, not <laughs> by email, right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> let us know how things are going and now we have a little bit of time together as well and uh, I would really love to, to thank you to come here and I'm sure everybody else would also like to thank you so let's big thanks to Osama thank you <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs>